Welcome to Natural Recovery from Suffering. This is Scott Killaby and my dogs. You probably can't hear them in the background. I hope that you guys have some time. Because I need your time. <laughs> I need you to kick back because I'm just not in a rush. That doesn't mean it's going to be a long podcast. It just means this topic, I tried to do two other podcasts on this, and I scratched both of them. 86. Because, and I never do that. If you see a video or a podcast of mine, I don't edit except for shorts. Um, I just go because I trust my experience for the most part. I just go with what I, if I know I want to talk about something. And a lot of times I won't even do it twice. I'll just hit record and go. And I've always been that way with this subject because it feels like it should be spontaneous. But then I tried that with this, and it, it wasn't anything wrong with the podcast particularly. It's not like I, it's not like I'm wondering, is it really just connected to one thing? I'm not struggling with that question. I know that it is. It's something else. I'll tell you in a second here. Anyway, I did it once. I said no. I did it again, and I said, you know what? I'm not even going to do this episode. This is this one's not coming out. <laughs> Here I am. So I must have changed my mind. Okay. The reason that I think I've struggled with it a little bit is because how many fucking times have we heard it before? Seriously. Everything is, is this. Everything is that. Reducing everything down to this, to that. Now, if that's helpful in a given situation, great. But if it's just somebody, you know, engaging in reductionist thinking, as they say, like reducing diversity and something complex to one thing, which oversimplifies it or maybe creates overgeneralizations or stereotypes, we don't want to do that. But here's my, this, this is why I ultimately settled on I'm doing this episode and I'm going to reduce it to one thing because what I'm saying is in practice, if in practice, in inquiry, you will reduce all of your suffering to the extent that it's connected to this one thing, you're, you're skillful because then you're not bypassing if it's in practice, but then in, if in your daily life, you don't want to reduce everything to one thing. In other words, when you're not in inquiry, and you're sitting there talking to your friend and your friend says, um, well, anyway, how are you doing? Are you doing okay? And you say, well, I've learned through my work that when people ask that, they don't really care about the response. They're just saying that to stay safe from their own buried emotions. And so once you check into your body, because everything's drama, you probably lose friends. <laughs> Can you imagine if people just like on a dating profile, you just say, "So I I bury anger. I'm right in the middle of the process of uncovering that. So I just yell. I'll just yell randomly, and I'm feeling very free. Would you like to date me? By the way, people don't yell randomly doing anger repression work. That doesn't happen. But it sounded good." Or, you know, like, I've been hurt all my life. I've been bringing it on myself. I'm just discovering it now. I intend to bring it on to myself with you. Will you marry me? No. <laughs> so, we're not going to reduce everything to emotional repression in our everyday lives. That kind of reductionist thinking is not what I mean. That's just annoying. Or if you went up to anybody and said, or everybody and said, I don't think you're being authentic. I think you need to do, yeah, yeah, I think you have repression. I just noticed when you were sitting in the corner over there and that look on your face, it looked like you were happy, but right under it, I could see the rage. So, you know, work on that, would you? <laughs> but as long as we don't do that, if we reduce everything in practice to this one thing, freedom. Free at last, that's all I'm saying, free 
at last, or at first. It was free at last for me because I bypassed that one thing for a long time. S well, not 16 years. 10 years as a teacher, I bypassed this one thing. I'm going to tell you what it is. I know that you're, I can just hear you already. You guys are out there going, what the hell is he talking about? What's this one thing? Oh, you guys already know my answer anyway. But, okay, are we ready for it? The one thing. You can say it in different ways. If you start to understand that this is what it is, it can shape your life and your practice. I tell you, I'm telling you, this is context. Context is powerful in spirituality, especially when it's accompanied by very really good tools because then the tools or the skills or the practice reveals the actual experiential aspect and then the words resonate right so let me just to sit let just sit with this for a moment the one thing is all your suffering is connected to the fear of being yourself now that doesn't answer the question like okay now that we've heard that, we're no longer afraid to be ourselves. It's not that. It's just there's the start of understanding then that that one thing, when you, when you look at it, self, afraid to be ourselves. Well, this is where I think we can take from the non-dual traditions, actually. There isn't a self. But it very much feels like there is. Why? Because of emotional repression, because this fear of being ourselves, if you think about it, from the time we were very little, you know, looking at mom, oh, stuff those tears back. We just learn, be afraid of that fear, continue, or that sadness. Continue to be afraid of that. Don't show that with mom. Don't show that. Don't, and don't show anger with dad. Don't show, be afraid of that. Be afraid of that. Look at what we're doing, is we're contracting in the face of, the relationships with the people that love us the most. We can't even trust ourselves or them. No wonder we have a sense of separation or deficiency that gets created very easily from the fear of being ourselves. It's, it's not just the fear of being ourselves. It's a fear of even beginning to understand what that is. Because we're, we're responding as kids, aren't we? To them, to life. We're not like, hmm, I really need to get to being my real self. No, we're just like dad's yelling. What that means is I got to be quiet. Survival. Oh, mom is, I can tell that mom is, she doesn't like what I've, I can feel bad. I need to not, I shouldn't say things like that to mom. I shouldn't get angry. See, those are the things, those are the moments that matter. Those are the moments that create and strengthen that sense, that self-contraction. And this is what I mean, fear of being ourselves. And this is a physical thing, you know, a seemingly physical thing, this sense of separation, which I think, again, forms from, from the very moment that I breathe. I have to look at other people to see if it's okay to be me. I don't know what that is. But as I look around, it's like, well, mom's got her issues and there's dad. I'm learning from an early age, just like you. Before I even know it, that I must store these emotions, some of these. And I want you to just think about that for a second, storing emotion, fear of those emotions. Wouldn't that create, along with its mind-body connection, a sense of separation to protect oneself, you know, in relationship? And then, because we're deficient in these emotions that we've buried, a sense of deficiency. And then there's that ego development of I'm Scott and I'm unlovable and this is who I am, you know, early in my life because I bury the anger and other things. So how could I be lovable? How could I be me? I had to be something false. I had to make peace in my family from the buried anger and feel myself as unlovable because that went along with a sense of separation and deficiency. That's just who I was.
it wasn't a mistake and I'm not broken. It's how I developed. And I survived just like you. If you think of it that way, then it, I don't know, it's a different context. And you see that in every day of your life, because you learned how to survive that way, you keep doing it with everybody you meet and everybody you relate to. That's what I did. And I showed up as the peacemaker and the unlovable person. And I kept finding relationships that would reinforce all of that and keep the anger buried. And I didn't know anything about the buried anger, of course. Or much of the rest of it. But I hope you can feel into that and see how we just d develop into it. It's a matter of survival. There's nothing wrong with us. When we're suffering, our conditioning is successful. As Chrissy, one of my trainees said, it's a great way of saying it. So that we can look now with compassion instead of there's something wrong with me. Is that this is how I survived. This is how we all survive, by holding emotion back. We didn't even know we did it. That's what makes it repression. But we can discover it now. And so that is the one thing. The stuff that we buried, the, because of the burying of that, we developed into a false sense of self and separation and deficiency with all of its suffering. We keep it that simple. Then we see that, well... Not being ourselves is synonymous with suffering. Therefore, on this path, it gets real simple. There will be suffering as long as there's still repression. Because repression is fear of being ourselves. And that's something that you can trust in your experience. You can track it with the science that says repression is the root of a lot of suffering. And you can track it all the way because if there continues to be suffering, you know, well, go to that one thing. You're going to keep going to the one thing. And so in the next segment, I'm going to tell you why. I think that KI and this work can seem like something much, much more complicated than it is when you begin. And I'm, I think I'm going to be able to explain why that is. Stay tuned. Well, now that I've named the one thing, I don't really, I don't mind using words like well, this one thing is the fear of being your authentic self. But it's a little bit tenuous. You have to admit, even when people say things like, well, all suffering comes down to ego. What does that mean, really? It's kind of vague. Or like, where does suffering come from? Because we believe and we live in separation. I mean, it's true. But like, okay, but what do you do with that? You know? It's just vague and, and so then I become a little bit technical even when sometimes people will criticize me for that but I'll try to explain why is to get away from tenuous connections vague undefined spiritual terms and pointers that lead to bypassing and even ways of talking about spirituality that I think lead to bypassing I became technical for that reason because I was bypassing To me, even the word awareness can be used in a, let's see, how do I want to say this? A, in, a, in a way that distracts us. You would think it wouldn't, because we're talking about the awareness to which things come and go. How could we be distracted? Well, because the unconscious is buried in that. So that's the programming in the inner body responsible for and directly connected to the suffering that we see coming and going in awareness. So we're definitely unconscious when we just sit here as awareness. Until we're embodied, we're unconscious to a great aspect of our experience, that the root of suffering in the body. So we're obviously, uh, in my view, not as awake as we think uh, in, in my view, in, in my experience, until we're embodied. Because these connections that are really deep in the body must be made conscious. Otherwise, there's still going to be suffering. So I don't want to use words like awareness, for example, in ways that, that point us away from the fact that the root of suffering is already buried and that it isn't arising to awareness.
So let me get technical for a moment so we can get away from that kind of thinking. When I say one thing, you, I'm not saying like, okay, if you bury anger, then that's it. Because it's actually a set of things, but it makes up a network of programming. One network. That network changes a little bit, but it's a very core network. And let's say, for example, <clears throat> that I bury anger and like, well, like I did, and femininity. That's just a few programs that I can discover in my body. Very, very unconscious because it's repressed, but it's just a few. It's, it's very simple, actually. It's I'm angry. And there's emotion with it if it's buried. And then I can't express it. And there's the resistance to it, which creates that repression. And that's conditioning. And, but it's that simple, really. It's the anger and then the fear of it, you could say. And so then if I had femininity repression, it's the same thing. It's I have that in me, but I can't. There's the fear. And this fear, both of anger and femininity, ends up being the frozen fear that we're calling the sense of separation. To me, it's the same thing. What the trauma research says is the frozen emotions or fear in our bodies. That's the sense of separation that we talk about in non-duality. Just different words for it because it's a different approach. But when you feel into those, to the body, to the sensations, you find this programming if you have buried anger and femininity. And so, the one thing <laughs> for me was pretty simple. Make those programs conscious because I was afraid of those things. And the fear of those things, the repression of those things created the false identities on the surface. As I said, by holding back anger, the identity was, I have to be good, peaceful, kind, and <clears throat> I can't be bad or wrong, can't be a narcissist, that's wrong. See, that's all identity coming from anger repression. And then as a straight acting gay person in the community, gay community, that came from femininity repression. These are, these are identities, this is how I showed up in the world. Repression is behind it. So much of it is emotional repression, though. <clears throat> so people's network, your network, that's the one thing. It's a core network. We call it a net for practice purposes in KI, but it's a network. So it's a group of programs that are actually connected, but we're unconscious to it. I'll give you a really easy example. If I'm an anger repressor and I believe, like I did, that I'm unlovable, that's in the network with my anger repression. It's very closely associated with it, but there's a, an unconsciousness there. So, in other words, I don't know, many of us don't know, that our identities, our ego identities, are coming straight from repression because the anger is buried. But what might not be as buried or as unconscious might be the sense I'm unlovable, and it was less unconscious. So many people will process ego identity because it's less unconscious. See that? That's why I think non-duality gets into its bypass. By working with something that's more conscious than the root of suffering, which is repression. Many people just do not know that their ego identities, self-limiting beliefs, shadows, core deficiency stories, that realm of identity suffering is all connected to repression because there's an unconsciousness there. But in the network, when you do this work, you're making conscious, not only do I believe I'm unlovable, but that I'm angry, but I'm afraid to express it. There's your network. Remember, because I said anger repressors, it's simple for us. It's I'm angry, but I can't. And that's programming. That's connected to I'm unlovable because that's safer. All my life, it was just simply safer to believe I was unlovable and even to feel like hurt or woundedness or sadness, safer emotions for me than to feel and express anger to the people that I loved. And that is so clear to me now, but it never was before. That's why I want to come out here and just talk about the one thing. The one thing is different for everyone, but it's repression for everyone. So again, my core network was 
the femininity and the anger programs. I'm angry, but I can't. And the femininity expression, but I can't. And that's it. And, I, and once I could stay there and make those conscious, change has happened. Embodiment happened. But every time I try to get away from that, it just wasn't the same process. So that, that's the KI by, bypass is to try to get away from the very thing that is the driver of the suffering. And that's what we try to do. And that's how we complicate it when we come to KI. It, we, we are completely innocent, but our nervous systems have to complicate this. Because we cannot just go to anger or buried hurt or sadness. Our systems are developed against doing that. So they are designed to instead produce things that are safer than the buried stuff, which the realm of identity, and then there's disease and chronic pain, according to the science, of course. All that being safer than what we've buried. I've done shorts on Instagram, and, and I've said that people think I'm joking or I'm just playing with words, but I'm not. When I say that my system chose cancer or chronic pain over feeling and expressing anger, that's a, like an accurate statement of what my system was doing. It was survival. I don't know how else to say that. So my pain went away because I can feel and express anger. And it's that simple, but we complicate it is what I wanted to say in this segment. And we do that by resisting the work, by being unconscious to the root, and then our systems just take us away from the root of repression, and then we don't even know we're being taken away. And that's how the bypass happens. We're completely unconscious to the fact that our system refuses to go to the root of suffering. And it's the root of suffering driving that. So our job is to make the root of suffering conscious. But along the way, the system's going to put up as many strategies as it can for safety and to get love instead or to get approval. And that's just the conditioning doing what it's supposed to be doing, surviving. But that's also our suffering. That's the conditioning that we make conscious. That's holding back those emotions to stay safe and then also to get love and approval. So now it sounds like, oh, well, that's just so simple, Scott. Thanks for, I mean, it's, it is simple, but the work isn't easy because our systems complicate it, resist it. And I think that's one of the reasons for the podcast. It's not just to say, you know, tongue in cheek or whatever. Hey, this is real simple, guys. Just go do it. Because it's, it's, <laughs> there's more to it, right? Because of our systems and how they complicate and resist. And I mean, one day when a bunch of people have done a lot of repression work, we're going to sit back and laugh at how we come in in the beginning of this work. And we think, oh, this is, wow, this is different than just be here now. But actually, it's really simple. But our systems are designed to just absolutely refuse to see it. And that's why we continue suffering. But if you sit with the context enough and just hear me, this is why I repeat it, I think sooner or later the simplicity, if you're doing the work, that is, really does start to show up. But you have to do the work. So stay tuned a little bit more. Well, here's one way of explaining the what I'm talking about here is you, as a teacher, you can point to awareness and use the word awareness just a little bit and people will start repeating it because we're just human. And, you know, we become these, you know how it is when you listen to non-dual and meditation pointers, your mind starts to pick them up to remind you. And then you start hearing it and then your consciousness gets filled with non-dual concepts even sometimes. Awareness, presence, whatever that is. Why are we so okay with m making that about that one thing and repeating that, but not seeing how simple this is and picking it up that easily? In other words, when, this is so weird as a teacher because I used to sit there and make it really simple. Like, it's just presence. Everything's coming and going to it. And people would just pick that context up because it was so simple, repeat it. You could turn that into a direct investigation. It's just simple. And, and they didn't have any problem repeating it. You know, and I just noticed that people would post on their own pages the same kind of pointers. No problem. 
But when it comes to this, it's not the same. So if I say this comes down to making conscious a couple of programs is what I mean by technical. This is about making conscious throughout a process a, a few programs in a network. I'm angry, but I can't express it. Simple. That's it. And that's a, that's a practice. I mean, in terms of just the context, I'm not talking about the practice itself, but just the context, just like awareness is a context. That's how simple this is. Emotional repression drives suffering. Make those programs conscious. But, okay, <laughs> it isn't the same, though. People will not then pick that up as easily and, and repeat to themselves, it all comes down to one thing. There's a core network of programs in my body, and I don't know what they are. That's why I'm suffering. And every day, oh, I, I'm suffering because I, there's repression. There's a core network of programs running my suffering. I don't know what it is. And if they would just repeat it, they would start to, like, oh, now I know my work is to make that conscious, whatever that is. But the system doesn't work in favor of this work in the same way because the awareness pointers and language are safe to the nervous system, essentially, for most people. Not everybody, but most people can pick it up and actually feel safe with that and secure in a way, repeating that kind of stuff to themselves. But repeating this is not the same. The nervous system doesn't like it as much. And yet there's deeper freedom with this because they're getting to the root of suffering. It's just crazy if you see it all. I mean, I could go back to just using the word awareness and people pick it up is what I mean. I would have more video views on YouTube and everything. But because I'm aware that the nervous system, when I say, hey, this is really simple. There's a root of suffering, just a few programs in a network, make those conscious. And then here comes the nervous system, not only create the, the conditioning, not only creates all the, like that's complicated. Why, why, why not? And then here, there, why not this and this and this? And then I keep saying, no, go back to, I'm angry. And I can't express it in inquiry. Or go back to, I'm hurt. And I can't express it. Make that conscious. And the nervous system goes, yeah, but I need to go look at this, this, and I'm feeling ashamed. And I'm like, well, shame keeps you safe from that buried stuff that you're hurt, but you can't express it. That shame is there to protect you from it. And they'll like, well, that's complicated. I'm like, no, it's really simple when you're clear, but when you're unconscious, that's, that's what complicates it because you can't see the connection. And then the mind tries to justify, I need to go look at shame a lot, which we should process shame, for example. But if we stay processing shame, shame of what? Of what we've buried primarily. See, I'm ashamed as an anger repressor of, that I have, I'm angry because I can't express it. I'm ashamed. So we have to poke it or connect it right down to um, the repression, the shame does. And then that's just one way we complicate it. But it could be, we complicate, we don't complicate it. It's not a judgment. It's just that I'm trying to address the simplicity of it and how our nervous systems interface with the, this work. And so the realm of identity is very complex. That gets created by the nervous system, though. You know, this work doesn't create that. This work comes to address it and to say that can be simplified. So all those identities, no matter what they are, they're there to keep us safe. We'll show you that. Safe from the buried stuff. The same network. I'm hurt, but I can't express it. Or I'm sad, I can't express it. Simple. But see, I'm just telling you how it works from a trainer or a teacher standpoint. Somebody comes up to be mentored, and they've got a list of... I love people. I really do because they're doing, they cannot help it. They're just doing the best that they can with that consciousness they have that just says, I've got a ton of identities. I think I am all these things. And yet, if I could fast forward with that person a year, two years, whatever it takes when they go through the program, like really a real program with me or us, and, and, and have them be interviewed after doing the work, they would go back and see that and go, all of that was there to keep me safe from what? The one thing. 
I'm angry, but I can't express it. Depending on what the repression is. But you can't see that in the beginning. And neither could I. I couldn't see any of this. And that's how the unconsciousness works. And that's how it's apparently supposed to work. But how else could it keep us safe and get us love and do the survival thing if it didn't do it unconsciously? But because awareness is the foundation of our experience, we can make it conscious. It's there almost like a bug in the system. But it's not, there's nothing wrong with it, you know? That's almost a judgment of it. It's just like it's something that doesn't have to be there. We don't have to have repression. We're, we suffer because of it. We're not better off at all with trauma. We just think that we are, that we need it. We don't want to let go of it at the unconscious level because we think it protects us. Our conditioning that says it's not safe to do this, feel that. But I can't do that when people start they have to start where they start. And so we, I just meet them where they are. So when they bring their list of identities, we go through each one, and sometimes they have to see for themselves, even if they have to just go home and look at it, that they believe that they are an engineer and that they're a loser, and then a bunch of other things. But as they look at each one, one by one, there's a utility for each identity. Utility inquiry is when you feel, when you have something up, like a belief or an identity, and you say, like, I'm, I'm an engineer. You say, what do I get out of believing that I'm an engineer? As you feel into the body and then you just listen. What do I get? You learn to interpret that. You may or may not hear it now. What do I get out of believing that I'm a loser? And then just feeling into the body and listening. But when people learn to do that, they start to see that every time they get something like, it protects me, it keeps me safe. It keeps me from doing this and that, which then I don't feel that, right? Because it's emotional based. Because we're gauging what we do or what we don't do based on what we might have to feel, and our system is taking care of us in that way. But so we learn then that we identify with things, these stories and things, because that's keeping us safe. That's also producing suffering because it's not what we are. But this, we learn this in childhood, right? Childhood development, we learn that we are something other than <laughs> a conscious, authentic, awake, unique expression of awareness, or however you want to say that, we don't think we're that, right? We have to believe these many, many identities. Even something like an engineer is, because there's energy on it, it's like you can come back to like, I'm still trying to get dad's approval, I'm angry at dad, I'm hurt, but I buried it. And now there's a contraction in my body and it's driving me to be the best engineer in the world, but I don't know why. Go to the unconscious and you'll find out why. One thing. And people might want to say, oh, you mean it's because I feel I'm not good enough and I'm trying to be good enough in dad's eyes? And I'll say, no. <laughs> no, that's in the realm of identity. That's the non-dual bypass, I'm telling you. That's a playground of, of just so much variation to distract you I mean, it's, it's valuable, it's important, it's your life, it's what you think about yourself. It will be brought into process, but it's not where we're going to go ultimately. The one thing is, this even this not good enough is there because you have unprocessed emotion towards whomever, dad, mom, made you feel a certain way about yourself when you were a kid, but you couldn't stand up and say, I'm angry fuck you, mom and dad, I don't take it anymore. Or you couldn't say how hurt you were or sad. You couldn't feel it, couldn't express it. So you had to hold all that back, and then you couldn't be yourself. And this could be a daily thing. And then you just became something that you're not. Because you couldn't be yourself. 
but how conscious of you of that are you? In the beginning, you might understand it, but it's only when you do the work that you you go beyond understanding into seeing and transformation. Okay, so what does the one thing, all our suffering is connected to this one thing, what does that look like in practice? If you were to come here, if you're not already, and you were to say, okay, I listened to your podcast episode, all my suffering is connected to one thing, I took your test, Scott, <laughs> at the end of the podcast, I'm here, what do I do? Stay tuned. If you truly knew how to get to the root of suffering and what the skills were, wouldn't you just get to it in any moment that you noticed any suffering? And it, if you knew that it wasn't just that the suffering in that moment would go away, which it, it would, but that you're actually getting to the root of suffering itself. So that if you continue in that process, the suffering will stop arising at some point. Wouldn't you just go and do it all the time? if you're suffering, for a while until you don't have to do it anymore because the suffering isn't there. No, it doesn't work that way. We resist that because this one thing, this core network of unprocessed stuff from childhood is what has created our identity, the sense of separation, the world that seems like it's out there objectively but isn't. We're creating it all, whatever we're seeing. That we have a vested interest in that continuing, that suffering, that world, those identities, all of that keeps us safe from what we've buried. This is ego development. This is a powerful mechanism. It has at its very core the holding back of, of these emotions. And if that, that programming at that level is not interested in just like picking up a practice and just getting it done. And so really, one way that our system complicates, as I said in that critique of presence practices, is just adding time to it. You know, saying this is going to take too long, how long will this take? And then that's just avoiding the buried stuff. and Or the seeking itself is how we do that. The repression creating all that to distract us. We don't know that though. So if you knew it, if you knew you could get to it, would you do it diligently? No, you would resist it. And you would learn that your resistance is part of the suffering. It's how you stay safe. And you would develop skill and context to meet that. Because your nervous system and your conditioning is very powerful and intelligent. You have to become conscious of that. That's the only thing you can do with it. You can't change it or fix it. Because it's running things. You can either be unconscious to it or conscious. As you become conscious, when you it's just like anything with awareness. If you if something comes into awareness, and now you see it's an object in awareness, it's not you. You see it. As you do this work more and more, that's how the anger or sadness that you bury gets ultimately transmuted, and just into presence, because it's brought into awareness. But because it's buried, we have to do that in a particular way with certain skills. But that's, that's what you do. You bring inquiry to the forms of suffering, and the suffering ends if you're skillful and you stick with it. But so much of the work you'll see is about how we address it when you resist and how that resistance happens, how the mechanism of repression shuts you down so that you won't. You'll still suffer, so it wants you to suffer, but just means stay safe, get love, hold yourself back survive as a separate self with a sense of deficiency which is actually emotional deficiency so there's the, essentially the practice since so we have to talk about the resistance and some of the front end stuff are just some of us legitimate questions that people have like since i'm talking about the one thing and remember i'm saying it's only in practice 
this reductionist thing you're reducing in practice, you're going to the root of suffering. That's that one thing. It's not that we turn this work into the new religion or into a cult or to the next language loop that we can't drop. So let me explain that for a second. When I am not on here talking about this work, this work is the last thing that I think about. When I stop work at about three, maybe four on a certain day, like stop working with people or doing social media stuff, I do other things completely. <laughs> this work has brought me my life. So I get to be myself and enjoy those things, including things I like to watch on TV, things I like to do. This work is a big part of my life. But when I'm not doing this, I don't sit and think about repression unless an insight comes up naturally. Because this is deprogramming. It's not taking the programming that we already have and just replacing it with new programming around repression. That would just be the same thing. We're getting to the mechanism that fixates in programming, which is the repression. And we fixate to stay safe. If I can sit here and just, and some people will do that. They can't help it, but they'll come here and just repeat what I'm saying as a substitute for actually getting to the repression because it keeps them safe just to repeat the words. But that's not what I'm inviting you to do. Just to be clear, I'm inviting you to go and do the practice. So I'm not trying to program you, but speaking of the programming, this is programming that your, your system doesn't want to repeat, most of you. See, when I was doing the awareness, I mean, me neither. <laughs> That's why I stayed in repression. When I was doing the awareness, teaching the way I was doing it, you know, like a lot of other teachers, that was really very, I wasn't intending to, but just using the pointers to awareness because not only is it pointing to the awareness that we are, which there's a draw towards that for all of us that seek that, but also it would regulate the nervous system, as I've said recently in podcast. But people who have repression don't really know that. They just might say, well, I feel better, or I feel more at peace from sitting with that teacher, or I feel that presence is myself. Part of that is recognition, and the other part is regulation of the nervous system that is traumatized and is seeking that regulation and that safety through those pointers and through those that language loop of the non-dual or the different pointers or the practice tips or whatever that remind us to be here now or that everything comes and goes to awareness. We can easily get programmed there because there's safety in that. That's what our system likes. So if, if I can grab onto any system of thought or framework that distracts me from the fact that I'm raging at the unconscious level or hurt and terrified of it, I'm going to pick that up pretty willingly, much more willingly than maybe this stuff. Even though it's kind of cool because it gives you such great insights, you got to do the work and the system doesn't like that. So it, I don't know, although anybody can repeat anything, if you can see that you're really resisting the greatest programming that's already within you. It's not really about me trying to program you. What I'm trying to do is point pretty relentlessly to how you avoid that programming like I did and you continue to suffer. And that program wants you to suffer, AKA stay safe, get love, hold those emotions back. The one thing. I mean that one network And hopefully by saying it a lot, you will go reduce your practice to that one network. That's the whole point of this. And but the other point of this is that I'm don't I want I don't I'm not trying to program you in the mind. And let me explain that. Because those questions like, is this a cult, another language loop, are all valid to me for the simple reason that up until this work and I cleared my repression that created my authority issues and my issues with groups. Here's how I felt about groups. Speaking of cults. No. No. Nope. 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 It was a group of boys that bullied me. No. I spent a whole life staying away from groups and joining groups and spiritual communities. 
I think one of the reasons that I didn't get more popular as a teacher was because of my anger repression, because I didn't want a following around me. I didn't want a group. That was a trauma response. No. Anger repression, repression disconnects us from people. That's how we stay safe. And if you were bullied like me in a family or a group setting, those are traumatizing or potentially re-traumatizing situations to the nervous system. And it's a no at the unconscious level. Now, I've dealt with all that. So now do I want to shift to the other end of the spectrum and start a cult and make everybody not feel like they can leave? No. But that's not a trauma response, no. That's a no coming from the clarity of knowing that when people get together in an unconscious way, damage is done. And perhaps the biggest cult is the cult of human conditioning, as Dan says, or as I've heard him say, that that's the cult, is that we're conditioned to conform and submit to our own emotions, submit to others, and not be ourselves from a very early age, and continue to think that that's what we are, and then reconfirm it in every relationship until we die. And most of us never get out of that cult. Alive. But, touche, because is this a cult? All I can tell you is, I don't have a disdain for groups like I did. I have an openness for people to get together who are like-minded, who want to use this context and these tools, just like Dan does, to get free. We don't want you to stick around for too long, especially if you're here because of trauma bonds that you're not working through, or projections towards us, good or bad, or the inability still to feel and express what's true for you with to your loved ones, which means you're not taking the work deep enough. You can stay as long as you want, but we're not here for lifelong followers. And I can't speak for Dan, but yet I can, because he's my best friend, and I know him well. He would say the same thing, I think, right here. And I intend to bring him on, but I think he would. So if you know that, but still you shouldn't trust us, that comes to another thing. Because as an anger repressor, at the unconscious level where my spinal stenosis was, the chronic pain, it was a distrust of people. Just being honest, and you'll find it too. We bury it. We don't trust ourselves. We can't. Since, since we were kids, we can't trust not only that we're the awareness, but we can't trust and feel and we can't trust our own emotions, feel and express them. Therefore, we can't trust our AKA self. Even though there's really nobody here, there is the experience of being, right, with emotions, whether they're separation or not. And I am talking in somewhat of a non-dual way because I just criticized presence practices in the episode before this. So it's like you got to replace that with something. And I'm going to be talking about that more and more throughout this, the remainder here, is trying to help you understand that you shouldn't trust me, not because I'm not trustable. You'll have whatever thoughts about me you'll have. You shouldn't trust me. You should trust me only enough to... Listen to what I'm saying and get to the skills and verify it for yourself and start trusting yourself. Because you probably have conditioning to some degree that doesn't trust me anyway or doesn't trust people or maybe authority. Anger repressors have that issue with authority and so do sadness and hurt repressors sometimes. Yes, definitely they tell me that. Just know this, you, you do need to trust yourself and not me. Just use what I'm saying to get to the place where you start trusting yourself. And then in terms of the, I can't compete again, as I said, with the awareness pointers and language. That's where the system seeks safety or it seeks safety through belief systems. There's not really a belief system here. There's a pathway of inquiry and there's no belief system. There's a context which means a set of concepts that are created to help you in practice get to the one thing and not bypass or not avoid that one thing and prolong suffering or create more. Begin to end the suffering. 
Now, the rest, you can't trust me, just do the work. <laughs> you can, but where does that get you? Because it's still you still can't trust yourself. Perhaps go do the work any, either way, whether you trust me or not. Give it a try. If you're like me, I came to spirituality to get away from life and relationship. I want to talk about that in the last segment. And more of the non-dual to replace this criticism that I gave in the last episode. More about the non-dual and the embodiment process to help, not to you trust me, but to assure you and hopefully in a way that you resonate with that this is a non-dual way, path of inquiry, if you take it deep enough. Our system likes to resist that, but it's a really good embodiment process. It really is. And I want to try to explain that because I just, yeah, criticize those other practices, even the ones I was putting out in the world. But like, you can't just argue against an existing reality. You have to create something new. And that's what I, we are creating here, hopefully. A little bit more on that, though, coming about the one thing. You have to go through whatever process you have to go through. Whether you're in like a pre-contemplation stage where you're just listening to me and Dan and others, or whether you've just started, or even whether you're disagreeing a lot, it's all okay from our standpoint, obviously. <laughs> what we can do about it? other than process anything that we have on that. But I want to reiterate that it's not just about you. It's about us. It's about me. And I want to share, because this is my experience too. <coughs> I came to spirituality, as I said, to get away from life and relationship. But what that really means is that the one thing was driving my suffering. I had buried emotion, anger, and other emotion that was driving, like science says, my suffering, which looked like I was get, trying to get away from it. Escape, spirituality, seeking, you know, looking for enlightenment. That's what that was, repression driving that. But then this work brought me to myself, the embodiment of that. So it didn't make me have an allegiance, as I've said, to another language loop or belief system. When I stop work at four, I don't think about this. And I think that you'll find that too, is when you come out of inquiry, you don't just sit and think about inquiry. You go and do whatever you do. You live your life. And at the, when you do that, there's more freedom at that level to be yourself and live your life. And that's what I hope you experience here. And if you don't, it's you're not doing the work because that's what it does. It gets to the repression that creates your suffering where you can't be authentic. If you can be yourself, you start to enjoy living more, or the suffering goes away first, and eventually there's an enjoyment, it's energetic, and even at some point, enthusiasm, because you're really clearing the blockages that have sabotaged you, the self-imposed or self-generated suffering. And that's a lot, that's, that's big, that is a replacement of those old bypassing ways that I was doing. That's something to, to be interested in. It's what really makes me and Dan interested in it, talking about it and, and inviting you. But by criticizing all that, I wanted to make sure that I'm clear on what this is. When, again, Adya wrote in his book, The End of Your World, eloquently about the embodiment process, the end of your world, to keep this non-dual for those who might have been provoked or triggered by what I said in that episode, this is definitely a non-dual path of embodiment. Your world, see, we're not, any of us, experiencing an objective world. As I've said, that was put to rest by quantum physics, postmodern philosophy, non-duality, and the great traditions, um, evolutionary research, which says we're only experiencing fitness payoffs, what we need to experience to survive and procreate. Stay safe, get love. Those are the same as our utilities, we're not experiencing reality. None of us are experiencing the world. We're each experiencing our world. And we can't experience, any, experience anything beyond that. We're all having a different experience of what that is, even if we have some agreement about it. And what we experience is a reflection of our unprocessed emotion, as I've said. Our shadows are our shadows. 
if I am angry all the time at CNN or Fox, it might be because I've buried my vulnerable emotions. Hurt and sadness from childhood, I've never been able to open to those. I don't know that I have them. All that I see is my anger towards the television or the politician. I may think that has nothing to do with trauma. It is my trauma. I may sit quietly in a group of people not saying anything. I might think I'm just being peaceful. That's my trauma response. I have to. That's how I survive. We're creating our world through our trauma responses. That's what we see. We see what we need to survive emotionally. And the world gets created that way. And then we forget that we did it. As you become conscious, you see that you created it, that you did it, and that you're doing it. And by having the right skills, you can make that mechanism conscious. Whereas before, I couldn't give that to you or show that to you as a teacher with those presence practices. You'll resist it like we do, and that's what prolongs it. It makes it seem like it lasts a little bit longer than it should because we don't want to get to the root of suffering. We have to understand that. The one thing is driving everything, and if there's one thing that the one thing wants... It is to continue driving everything. Survival of the so-called separate self. You don't want to wait for others to transform in relationship because then you'll just be staying safe in those relationships and suffering more. You can, but if you do, you'll see that you're staying safe. It all boils down to the one thing you'll see in the end. That until you get to that network and make that conscious, the suffering will continue and you can trust that much more than you can trust me. Because the inside and out are one. The one thing is driving the suffering that you're seeing on the outside. You no longer have to stand in a sense of being just powerlessness, powerless. For example, seeing the world and believing there's nothing that you can do about it and it's all independent of you. Because what you're seeing is the reflection of your own consciousness. And that's not independent of you, you're creating it within your own awareness from the unconscious repression to stay safe from that and to continue to survive as what you perceive yourself to be that separate self. If you take this work deep enough, that all gets seen through and embodied. You will fight it. <laughs> right? Think about it. This is what I mean by a mature path. When we see we're creating the suffering and we're creating the seeking to delay the freedom and then we forget we did it and then we blame outward or we point outward. Where's the answer? What's happening? And then that's how we continue doing it. But here you have the skills and hopefully the context to go, okay, no, I'm not falling prey to this anymore. I'm going to gain the skill. I'm going to listen to him long enough to see that when, for example, I think it's something other than the one thing, it's still the one thing. But I have to see it for myself. Can't trust Scott. For example, going back to the cult thing, right? Got to verify my own experience. So if I'm believing, I'll just say I'm you. If I'm sitting here believing, again, I'm not heard. And it's not about the one thing, Scott. It's that my partner doesn't hear me. And I've been in relationships all my life where I wasn't heard. And if I could be heard, that thing, that one thing then would end my suffering. And I'll say, no. <laughs> Look. You believe you're unheard because when you were a kid, something happened and it may have been developmental. It may have happened over and over again as part of just your relationship with your parents that you didn't feel heard. That can obviously create quite naturally emotions in a child and there was nothing wrong with you for having or generating those emotions, even the ones that were buried that didn't feel safe to feel. And some of them did it. And when you didn't feel heard, you also couldn't feel and express what was true for you in those moments. So not being heard got 
wrapped up into or was produced by also connected to, you could say, the fact that you had to bury those emotions and then believe that you are someone who's not heard in order to survive that family. And then your system kept doing it in relationship after relationship with those men or women. And you continue to feel unheard. And by thinking that the one thing is the fact that you're not heard, then you hide the real one thing from yourself, which is what? Whatever your primary repression is. If you bury hurt, that's the one thing that you haven't opened to that network. I'm hurt. Not that thought, but the actual mechanism that's buried. I'm hurt, but I can't express it. If you could feel and express and process that, the I'm hurt identity would stop arising eventually because it's there because it was part of childhood development. The development of who you think you are or became. But that's not really who you are. But if you keep thinking that the I'm unheard is the one thing, it'll keep happening and you'll keep thinking that's who you are. Because at the unconscious level where you're staying safe from the buried hurt, that's what it wants to happen. It creates the identity, you could say, even though it's not an entity. The identity is there for safety, for survival. You learned it. To unlearn it is not to focus on it, but to get to the mechanism that created it for survival. Holding that emotion back. That's, that's an integral part of it. Can't make an end run around that. If you say to me, Scott, it's not the one thing. It's that I don't, it's like that one person said, Scott, with addiction, it's that we have to unconditionally love each other. And when we unconditionally love each other, then the addict will heal. And I'll say, yes and no. Because how can you unconditionally love someone, first of all, if you can't allow your own emotions? So before we start rescuing, saving, or unconditionally loving someone else, we ought to see what are the unprocessed emotions that I bring to that addict? And what are the unprocessed emotions that created that addiction? Because that's science. That the one thing creates that. The repression creates addiction. And of course, if one opens to all their emotions the ones that are buried, and they experience that unconditional acceptance of their own authentic being, then of course unconditional love is right there for oneself first. But then one doesn't look outside for that. The whole idea of looking outside for what we are is what created when we were kids. We couldn't be ourselves, so we looked to mom and dad for unconditional love, and then we think we're going to find it as adults in someone else. When we, we didn't know ourselves when we were kids, we need to discover that first and discover what love is by loving those parts of ourselves that didn't feel safe and that created that addiction. And that's a process because we learned to not know that these addictions are driven by the one thing. We learned it well. Like trained like athletes every day. Sometimes it's just a process of deduction or whatever, of elimination, where you just hear different ways in which we try to imagine that it's not the one thing. And we just see that that's the one thing, trying to avoid the avoidance of that buried stuff again, masquerading as something else. And there's how we bypass. So just a few more examples. so many <laughs> there's just so many I'm sorry there's one after the other coming up for me of ways to talk about how we distract ourselves from the one thing and I'm just trying to pick one <laughs> that I haven't talked about yet I mean, I've talked a little bit about it, but when people say, Scott, you're talking about this trauma stuff has nothing to do with real freedom. The one thing is the ego. And I'm not even going to go into it for very much. No, that's the ego activity is what's co more conscious than the repression. And we wouldn't even believe those things if we could be our authentic self. 
if we could feel and express what was true, we wouldn't believe those ego identities. Those are there for safety and to get love too. But don't believe me and don't trust me. See for yourself. The one thing is the one thing. And it likes to make it look like it's something else. Because it's repression. People say, oh, it's, it's environment, Scott. You're making too much about the emotional stuff. It's not all trauma. Now, I'm not saying that everything in life is that. I'm saying that your suffering and your life is this one thing. Because think about it this way. If, if you had the gene for addiction, for example, or just for some trauma that was just there or some predisposition, but for some reason you were born into a really conscious family, and that family taught you from the very beginning to open to any previous trauma you had, but to open to all your emotions and to know what you really are. The environment, the trauma is what ultimately is the anchor of it all. Because even if you have the gene, the science says they still have to have the environment that turns it on. Which means you have to have parents that are unconscious. You have to be in an unconscious family. That's the trauma. That's what turns it on and keeps turning it on for us if you think in terms of genetics. But intergenerationally, not only are we maybe passing it through the DNA, but we're modeling it. The day we're born, we're learning how not to be ourselves. And with everything that we carry from any previous. And so when you really see it, how the one thing is running everything, and how we're, 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 we've developed to hide it from ourselves, you finally turn towards it. And I'll just leave you with one more example of how cunning it is. And I've said this before, I think, maybe in the last podcast, but people have said to me, and I've said to myself, it's shame, Scott, or it's fear. That's the one thing. And first of all, I'll say, let's talk about both of those. Shame. What I discovered is my system produces shame to keep me safe. Now, at first, I didn't know what from. And that's exactly how the system wants it. Hide the ball. But shame, I noticed, was just more conscious than anger repression. My system in the hierarchy of safety was choosing shame over feeling and expressing anger to my loved ones. And for you, it might be sadness or hurt. The shame is intrinsically connected to the repression. But because the repression runs things and it likes to hide, the shame gets produced and then there's the distraction. Now, nothing is really a distraction in the ultimate sense, but as I said in the podcast, A Trillion Distractions from the Source, it really is, from a trauma perspective, shame. Because we're ashamed mostly of what? Do we even know? Shame is like an identity that kind of replaces what we really are. We're ashamed of being ourselves because being ourselves would include feeling and expressing that anger or that buried hurt. So our system has buried that and it protects us by producing the shame. But when you get below the shame to the buried stuff, the shame goes away. To the extent it was connected to the buried stuff, if it's connected to sexual stuff, it still has a connection to the buried emotions. We can't be ourselves in our relationship. We can't in sex. We can't be ourselves sexually, of course. It's just all connected to the one network whatever that looks like for you. And you can really bypass by thinking that shame is the one thing and not seeing that, no, you're ashamed of the one thing, of being yourself and for you that might be bearing anger or hurt or whatever. And so shame is a part of it. It gets included, but it's not the one thing. It's certainly connected. And then what about fear? Before I leave, fear. Yes, that's the one thing. I think I started out the podcast saying it's fear, but this is a hard one to get here. And I've even said this before in the podcast, but it's worth repeating because the mind will try to go in, as I said, a trillion different directions away from the one thing. And here, this one fear. What is the fear? I said earlier, it's death right now of ego is to feel and express what's true. It includes that because the holding back of those emotions creates the ego activity.
We're afraid, of course, of losing people if we express the hurt or the sadness that's buried. That fear is there. There's a fear of trusting people. If we have repression, we may not know that's because we don't trust ourselves to feel and express what's true, but still, we don't trust people. There's this fear. And it's there, of course, because it is the basis of everything. But how we can, we have to be careful with that too, I've noticed. Because people, systems produce anxiety because we're afraid to be ourselves. And it's a persistent thing because we can't feel and express whatever is buried. So the anxiety keeps being produced. And to the system, that's actually safer in some sense than feeling and expressing anger that's buried to your loved ones or to hurt or sadness. So the system keeps producing the fear. Where is it coming from? The fear of what? Losing people, yes. Hurting people by being angry, yes. But ultimately, it's a fear that keeps you from feeling and expressing that buried emotion in each moment. It's a present fear that's frozen in your body. It's the self-contraction now. This is the repression. And it keeps you in each moment from that ego death by holding back those emotions and producing the ego activity. So it can look like you put the ego activity rest by recognizing awareness, but you haven't put the mechanism underneath that to rest. And this is why some teachers like me get sick or have chronic pain or, you see, it just keeps going on. We don't get to the one thing. Not to say when you get to it, you can prevent all disease because there's a variety of factors. There is environment, but you just can't divorce, divorce environment from or nutrition from your emotional system, which is also connected to your immune system, the science says, and it produces pain and all that disease. See, so yeah, it's fear fear of being ourselves, but to fully be ourselves, we have to feel and express what's buried, period. What else would being ourselves be? We're going to hold, hold off on that, just leave that part buried, but we're going to be ourselves. It doesn't work and it doesn't happen. And we should just say that. And it might scare us, speaking of fear, to say things like that, but that's the identity of separation and deficiency that gets scared by hearing things so they won't get to the buried stuff. At some point, we catch on to the mechanism. Get to the one thing. The end of your world, I wanted to bring it back to the non-dual to the extent I fully have it here because I did criticize the presence practices. But see, I want to, I want to include them all. They're all included, the ones that I criticize, but now they're supplemented by this 3D work that gets to the root of suffering and then you've got great practice. You're not bypassing. And so if you can see that this is a different path of inquiry, non-dual realization, if you take it deep enough, and you'll resist that. <laughs> I want to talk about the end of your world as Aja talked about your world. We don't see an objective world. What we see or what is what we see, depending on the thoughts, feelings, and sensations that are arising for us and our own awareness, which those are not independent of what we are. We are the awareness, and then there's an unconscious repression producing those thoughts and feelings and sensations that create that world that looks separate. The inside and out are literally one. And that becomes very clear when you get to the unconscious level. But before that, it looks like there's a world out there, and, 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 and maybe even independent and objective, even though it's been blown to pieces, as I've said, by the different fields of discipline. There's no objective world. We're just experiencing what we're experiencing to stay safe and get love, survive. But as we see that this getting to the repression mechanism at that level where the suffering is created, where our shadows are created that make it look like there's a separate world out there, which keeps us, or that we're experiencing that separate world out there, which keeps us separate from feeling what's unprocessed in here. As we do the repression work, the shadows go away. The world of suffering that we created go, goes away. We see that we were creating and believing that, that what we created was separate from what we are. We see that we created it. That version of the world goes away. So what comes in its place? <laughs> you.
It was always you. You just f fooled yourself into thinking it was not you. And so you move in the world in a different way. You don't experience the separation. You don't feel it in the body. You live it. And that's going to show up for you in whatever way it shows. It's not going to be like it used to, though, where you really seem like there's a world out there and you're like yelling at CNN or Fox News because you think that, that it's out there. It's not a trauma response. It really is unprocessed, buried hurt. You're getting angry because you can't open to the hurt, for example. Over and over you're getting angry or you're shutting down in situations and disconnecting from people because you can't express anger. But you think it's those people. It's something to do with them. The world that you create to stay safe and continue to love and get love and survive. Do we always, are we always then just nice, kind people? No, only anger repressors would say that. Or people who repress anger, who are very, very concerned with that because they're trying to stay safe. And they probably don't like angry people anyway and create a world out there that's where these angry people are the enemy or the aggressive people or something. And that's just the suffering they create. So no, when you wake up, you might not be as nice as you used to be, but you'll be real and you'll be free. And you'll see that the nice was fake anyway. It was coming from fear. But you'll be kind because you'll know yourself and you'll know that other people either do or don't know themselves and you'll have compassion for that because you didn't either. And you know why you didn't know yourself because you kept ignoring the one thing. And when you see people suffering, you know that they're ignoring that one thing. Do you want to attack them because they're ignoring the one thing? Hmm. Maybe, but is that coming from your one thing? In other words, are you processing that? Is that just another shadow? Or is that real for you? Because it might be, you might discover that you're angry at some things and you got to speak that, but you buried that all your life. And even though you know there's no world out there, you also know that being silent is how you created a world where you didn't have to speak up anymore or didn't have to speak up at all. And now you can. And even though you know there's no independent world, you know that that makes an impact in consciousness by speaking up. You were just afraid before. So you might not be a little quiet, peaceful, nice person all the time. You might have a voice. You never know how it's going to show up. If you tried to know, it would just be coming from the same network of programs that wants to keep you safe. And so it might say, oh, I'm just going to be nice. And everybody else will too. <laughs> no, everybody else will be what they are. No longer driven by the trauma if we take it all the way. Which means we may have started out thinking we're going to change the world and fix it first before we saw that we were creating it. Maybe even look for world peace or do things to bring that about. But we realize we created that, whatever we saw. And so we have to get to the business of seeing how we created it and ending our suffering first before we can really, really, really take action. Because before that, if we don't process along with it, we take action from the unprocessed. When we just move in the world the way we always have, as if the world is just there the way we see it, we keep suffering, we keep bringing suffering to our lives, and all that continues until we start processing that we're bringing the suffering to it, to what we're seeing, to what's ex being experienced. Then it changes. Then we move differently in relationship, we respond differently. If there's suffering, we can still process it, but we're not blocking ourselves, we're not suffering. At some point, we're really enthused about being because we have our life force online and therefore our joy the joy of being truly can't have that when i'm not getting to the one thing that's what i found i hope this helps um if you want to get started on the path, you can always go to killaby.com and scroll to the bottom of the page. Take the free repression test there. I'm also going to put a link to that in the description. 
um, section of this episode. And also I'm going to put a, a link to our May retreat, our first online retreat ever in May. Check out that link. Thank you for listening.